Carl, last last week, I think it was, we were talking about the, um, the Huffington Post has put out this uh, story about how women's ages and men's ages uh, of their, I guess, peak sexual market value. I, I thought this was really, really interesting. And they were saying that women peak at 18 and men peak at 50. And I thought that that's a, that's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, I think if anybody who has ever seen my, uh, my graphic um, of you know what I what I peg sexual market value out. I, I usually peg sexual market value for women at about 22 or 23, and I peg sexual market value for, of men for right around 36 to 38 years old, just simply because men have men establish themselves a little bit more, uh, in and the things that that make a man at his peak take longer to develop than what makes a woman peak. And I think this is, and people say, oh, well, Rolo, you must feel like some sort of vindication for this. And I'm like, well, vindication is just that this is something that I kind of felt internally. Because when I wrote that post, which is called uh, Navigating the, the sexual, mar sexual Marketplace, um, when I wrote that post and I did that graph, I was doing that. I, I just was kind of like tongue in cheek doing that. But I thought about, uh, you know, what what constitutes sexual market value for women and what constitutes sexual market value for men. And so of course, what do, what do people do? They, they go and they take that and they run with it and they say, well, you know, uh, women of 22 aren't, aren't going out with guys who you know, are 18 in this case, uh, women of 18 aren't going out with guys who are 50 years old. And it's like, that's not some are. <laughs> the point. Yeah, some are, but that's <laughs> not the point though. People want to say, well, you know, when I when I put that out there, people go, or women will go, ha, huh, I'm 23 and I would never date a guy who's 38 years old. I think that's not the point. They're going to this like bi these binary extremes, thinking that because I say your peak is here and your peak is here, so you guys should want to be with each other. No, that's not it. What that means is that at certain points in a man's life and certain points in a woman's life, they have their peak access. They had they reach their peak potential when it comes to the sexual marketplace. From, from my perspective, that's right around 22 or 23 for a woman, right around 36 to 38 for a man. Uh, and the reason I say that, again, is because what makes a woman uh, at her peak is not the same thing that puts a man at his peak. And I think it's interesting to see this coming from, uh, from the Huffington Post of all places uh, because it, uh, it, it kind of goes against their narrative because for a very long time when you look at um, – when you look at publications like Cosmopolitan, or you look at publications that that sort of front, you know, glamour, or you, they, they they front the the feminine imperative, they've always said that women reach their sexual peak when they get to be about thirty, right? And men reach their sexual peak when they be about eighteen or nineteen. And they're talking about sexual peak. I'm like, that's, I'm like, that's that's bloody convenient. I mean, when you talk about why, I mean, why would that be the peak when, when women get to write about their epiphany phase, right? When they're like 29 to 30, 31 years old, they want to say that. Well, the reason for that is because they know that they have to push women into this sort of sexual understanding at those, at those ages, because they want men to believe that, that that's about the time that they ought to be marrying these women or that they ought to be uh, committing to them right around when they need it the most. And that's usually the point at which women are officially kind of, if they're not hitting the wall, they're acknowledging the wall. And uh, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, that That's one story that's in the news. You guys have anything that, I, I, I know Carl has something to say about that. Well, it's the University of Michigan study and mm -hmm. it wasn't the world's biggest sample size, but I think we're kind of conflating multiple issues because I think what we're really looking at is maximum market penetration. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you have to, that's a, you yeah, have to that, I, I did that on purpose because <laughs> what, what happens is uh, when a man is, let's say, 50 years old, he's well established and he has, if he has kept himself in good shape, men can age very well into their 50s and 60s. Oh, and yeah. he will appeal to women from about epiphany phase up till his own age. Mm -hmm. for LTR, so we're looking to consolidate, but he can also dip into that pool of younger women on occasion, mm -hmm. especially if he has a lot of money. So at that point, he has the most appeal to the biggest possible market, whereas an 18-year-old woman appeals to just about every man. And we saw that from the, um, I think it was the OkCupid okay data that had the preferred age 
of men. And that woman was always between, you know, 18 and 23, 24. So uh, that's when women appeal to the largest possible segment of the market. And you can kind of see that on apps like Tinder, where you have a younger user demographic, that the women are getting like a ton of likes. Like for a guy, men's matches on Tinder tends to be, it takes longer to get them because you don't get as many likes as quickly. Because men tend to swipe right a lot more than women do. So I read about a trick that some guys have been using to up their uh, Tinder ELO score is that they set themselves up as looking for both men and women because then the gay guys will swipe right about three times as often as the women. Oh, and it ups their stats. Oh, clever. Yeah, it ups, ups their stats. So uh, I haven't tried that out personally. I mean, there's, Come on. Uh, no, yeah, no judgment there's here. a line there. There's a line that you don't cross. It's the same thing I said to you in the DM that, you know, fixing your hair and going to a barber and using moisturizer is one thing, but if you're, you're a guy who starts doing your nails, you cross some kind of line that you shouldn't be crossed. Hey, I was thinking too, Carl, you notice the one place that it sucks to be a 23 year old girl is porn. Yeah, because you're not young enough to- uh, Not young enough to be 18, not again. old enough to be MILF. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, the only place that you can't be hot at 23 years old is when you're getting paid for it, you know, overtly paid for it. I just found it's a weird thing and I'm not sure what to make of it. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting, but I think we have to look at it from, and I think that's kind of the thing with peak hypergamy too, because from my perspective, it's a product thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you go, if you use our case selection, I know it's been kind of disproven in the academic side of it, but if you're saying that, okay, men can run two strategies, beta and alpha. Mm -hmm. And over time, as women have preference for more and more alpha or more and more beta, they go for the more extremely niched products. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get someone like Anthony with that opener of his, that's just such an extreme alpha opener versus the guy who is polite and takes her out on a real date. Yeah. And um, I like I really like the fact that you brought up his tweet because it's actually kind of a brilliant observation that even just taking a girl out for a date these days will get you put in the beta category. Right. Yeah. That, and that's that's where I want to, That's a good segue into today's topic here. Uh, I, actually, what what kind of prompted me to to use you know to get to today's topic was that tweet by Anthony. And Anthony was Anthony's got a, a series of these right now. Um, and I thought they were real. I mean, cause he's, he's in the sexual marketplace, man. He is fully, you know, committed to the trail, I guess. Um, I've got a lot of other guys that I, I do some counseling with who are also in this, in this situation, but like, it's interesting to me to see these guys who are in their fifties, uh, getting back into the sexual marketplace and understanding it from a completely different perspective than when they were like in the sexual marketplace when they were younger. And so you got a guy who's like, say 20, you know, been in a, a marriage for 26 years and now he's coming back to it. And then seeing how he's re responding to this new sexual marketplace. And then looking at a guy like Anthony who just turned 30 and has been in it for at least the last 10 years and how he's dealing with it. And uh, what I wanted to talk about today is a, a couple things. The first thing is, uh, are we in peak hypergamy right now? And uh, what is the sexual marketplace look like in that in from that perspective? Um, have we reached a point where uh, open hypergamy is something that is just simply a given right now? And I I, I would argue that it is. Um, if if anybody's unfamiliar with the, the tweets that we're talking about here that that Anthony put out, uh, let's just say for sake of argument here, he posted the idea or pro proposed the idea that women today do not date. And I've been looking at a lot of uh, YouTube videos from these quote unquote, you know, dating experts or these sexperts or these relationship experts, and all of them are women. And they're all trying to, ex <laughs> of course, they're all trying to explain why it is that they can't find, like why women can't find that good guy, you know? And this is, this is classic, okay? This is classic stuff. So when, when, got, when women get to be about 32, 33 years old and they're looking to sort of cash out of the sexual marketplace, um, and find a long-term commitment with a guy. Uh, they're all looking around going, you know, where are the good guys? What happened? You know, I don't understand. Oh, you know, oh, these guys must be afraid of me or they must feel threatened because of my strong independence or it's men's fault that they're not here for me. And it's like, they don't, they simply don't grasp the idea that they're not desirable anymore. 
they are not the, the sexual market value for women is uh, is perishable and they've reached that that expiration date okay See, i take it one step further it's not even that they're less positive it's that mm -hmm. they're adding negatives because i don't know i like i don't see as many single women because i'm not out as looking as much but like the amount of unattractive behavior like remember the the two rules mm -hmm. be attractive don't be unattractive like they're crushing number two man yeah. it's fucking brutal mm -hmm. out there well anyway so the the tweets presented this and, and and carl just talked about this a minute ago uh women do not do not date anymore they only date betas they only date men who they think have some sort of long-term potential if they want to have sex they can go have sex they can go i mean we we talk about this all the time how women can the the the, the cost for women to get sex is much lower than it will ever be for men and they can go women can go out and get laid pretty much i mean even if you are you know a swamp beast you can go out and get laid if you're a woman okay you can go out there and just say hey like hey guys looking for some love okay i mean there's they the sexual marketplace is such that there are enough thirsty men out there that it's even the ugly ones can get some can get some action okay but what i'm saying and what what anthony is saying is that the sexual marketplace and dating has changed so much that when women are looking for the beta buck side of things, that's when they decide to add rules. And I, I've, I've talked about this before. W women will make rules for beta men. They will make hoops for you to jump through. They will say, you must wait three dates before we have sex, if that. Uh, they're, they're reaching their epiphany phase where they're going to go and say, uh, I want to do things right. I want to get right with God. I want to make uh, uh, the right decisions. I'm done with the bad boys now. I want to be a I good wanna, person. Yeah, I want to be a good person. And so even when they find that good guy that they say don't doesn't exist, when they find that guy, what's the first thing that they do? They don't they don't go and say, hey, I want to hey, let's you know, I want to give you my best. They make that guy jump through hoops. They make that guy qualify himself to her because first of all, they're they had their egos blown out to such ridiculous levels that they believe that men should always qualify to them. And certainly those men should qualify to her because those men are betas and they understand in their hind brains that those guys are the men are the kind of men who should be bringing something else to the table, who should be, who should have all these prerequisites for them to become intimate with them. Uh, but and you know, it's funny too, Rolo, I was thinking about this. You know how you had your thing about how women don't have game, mm -hmm. basically show up, bring beer. Yeah. And it's the worst thing. Like the more you're talking about these, like at 30, you're making them wait and you're basically doing all push, no pull. If mm -hmm. they were just do play a little hard to get and then fuck the same way they would do that. That's probably the best strategy to secure a man. Yeah. Make him think he, make him think he won you, but make him win you. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing about, I'm looking here in the, in the, in the, the chat right now saying even Tess holiday can get laid. Yes. She's a single mother. <laughs> I could not believe that. And I'm like, if Tess holiday can get laid. Okay. That shows you what the price and the, the, the cost point is, uh, you know, for, for men to get laid and, and women to get laid. So just keep that in mind when we're, you know, when we're, we're talking about this. And the thing that gets me is like, when I'm, when I'm listening to these women on these, uh, you know, the sex experts and the relationship experts telling me that it's so hard for, it's, it's so easy for, for women and that or it's so, so easy for men to get sex. They're saying, they're, they're, they're saying exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. They're saying that it's easier for men to get sex and women to get sex. And it's like, no, it's not. And the fact that you would even believe that, you know, proves to me that you're completely checked out from the reality of the game right now. But what Anthony was saying is that women, just define men into two categories. There's the alpha fucks and the beta bucks. We've already talked about that for you know, hypergamy because we have accepted open hypergamy to the point right now that women openly categorize men as being the alpha and the, and the betas. And the betas are the ones that they make rules for. The betas are the ones who have to qualify to them because those betas, I feel that women in their hindbrains think that they have to make compromises for. And they think that there has to be some sort of payoff for them to have some sort of transactional sex and have some transactional relationship with them. Whereas for the alphas, they're having that validational sex. That's a validating thing for them. So when women want to have sex, they can simply go on Tinder and find the guy who qualifies as the, the best alpha that they could possibly get with. And then there's the guys who have relationship potential. Now, just before I, I, I pass this off to, to you guys, 
I, I, this is a, 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 a con I'm just going to tell a story here. And I've told this story before. I have like these girls who are my poor girls, who are the girls that are kind of like my booth candy or the, the girls who go and uh, mix drinks for guys at some of the, the events that I go to. Uh, very attractive young women. And I mean, between the ages of say like 22 and 26 is, a, is about my, my demographic for these girls. And I've heard this before, um, actually on a couple of occasions where the, the girl was talking to the other girl and saying, cause they're usually their friends or they become friends really quickly. And the one girl says to the other, have you ever had sex on the first date or on the first night? Or would you have sex with the guy that you just met that, that evening? And the other girl said, you know, giggles and goes, eh, yeah, of course I have, you know, of course I would, but I wouldn't if I thought the guy was relationship material. And so what that said to me, you know, being sort of, you know, making mental notes of this conversation, what that said to me is that they are making a distinction between the guys that they will just simply give up sex for because that's what they want. And they understand in their hindbrains that they are at their sexual market value peak and they want to have their fun. And we, this is the, the, what I call the party years uh, between 18 and about 28 is what I, I peg the party years at. Uh, we, you can call it the cock carousel if you'd like, but um, I try to be a little bit more uh, diplomatic in that. Uh, but what that means is that at during that during that phase of a woman's life, she is she has the best market potential then, and so she can sort of say, "I want to have sex with this guy. Uh, I want to have a relationship with this guy." And so they make those distinctions where it's like they will give up that sex to an alpha guy. Whereas that same sex, they will make that beta guy jump through a lot of hoops. And so the, the long and the short of that is that when Anthony was saying that there are, there's that distinction between alpha, you know, women fuck alphas and women date betas. And the, the distinction that I think guys need to make in that is that if a woman is making you jump through those hoops, if she's saying, uh, I want intimacy, or I want uh, a commitment before we have sex. Uh, one of the guys that I, I counsel has said this, or he actually, he called in, uh, one, Mike called in one time and he was saying that the women that he was meeting, he's 55 years old. He was meeting some of these women uh, who are you know, 40 years old, something like 40, 45 years old who are making these demands saying, I, I want commitment before we have sex. And what that says to me is that she doesn't see him as that alpha. She doesn't see him as the kind of guy that she has sex with on the first night or the first. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that that's, that has to happen for him to be an alpha, but the fact that it has she's, to be on the table, but it has to be on the table, but it also has to be that she doesn't broadcast that she's seeing this guy as beta bucks and seeing this guy as a beta potential as opposed to an alpha potential. And so, uh, you know, what his tactic is simply to just blow these women off and look for more sexual potential in a woman who does see him as that alpha, where she is respecting him as the kind of, you know, the prospect of having sex with him is validational rather than transactional. And that's what he's finding right now is that there are, again, uh, even at 55 and women who are like 40 years old who have just, you know, reinserted themselves back into the sexual marketplace still think that they command the same kind of respect and the same kind of desire that they did back when they were in their twenties, but they don't, they, 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 they'll go on these shows or they'll go and, you know, do their podcasts and, and say, well, you know, men ain't shit. And we, you know, how come they think that they can get away with this? And, and it's like, they're basically broadcasting their over inflated egos. But when you're 40, 45 years old, ladies, you do not have anything like the selectivity that you did when you were 22, 23 years old, but they still think that they do. And the reason that they think that they do is because they're dealing with a guy who they, in their hindbrain, they understand is a beta guy. And if there was a guy who was, you know, we, we talk about cougars, okay? Like a woman who gets to be like, you know, like in her late thirties, early forties, and she wants to have sex with the guys that she liked back when she was in her party years. And maybe she has sex with a guy who's a young, you know, guy in college or something like that. And you have that Mrs. Robinson thing going on there uh, where you have a, a younger guy and an older, an older woman. She's having sex with that guy. She's not, she's not even, she's, she's not even thinking of having a relationship or a long-term relationship with a guy who's 25 years old. If she's 40 years old, she just wants to have sex. So that conversation never comes up 
that conversation yeah. between the two of them never happens. She just wants to have sex with that guy. And, you know, he's fun. He's a quote unquote boy toy, right? Whereas if you are, if you give off the beta vibe, if you give off the provider vibe, if you give off the, hey, I've got my shit together vibe, that's when they throw you into that category of make him jump through hoops, make him wait three dates, make him do this, make him, you know, qualify him and qualify him and qualify him. 